Okay, so good morning everybody on this special day of the sixth edition of the Brussels Summer School of Mathematics. Indeed, it is special in various respects, and it's the first time that this, there will be a course on a Saturday. It's the first time that we are leave, that we have left the plain campus and come here to this nice and colorful uh, room with some air conditioning now. <laughs> and uh, it's also the first time that we are having a drink afterwards. All this is due to the fact that we also have a very special speaker, which is Professor Don Daguier. Thank you very much for having accepted uh, the invitation. And uh, this a special guest speaker also deserves a special announcer, which is uh, Professor Luc Lemaire, who will now introduce in further details Professor Daguier. So I hope you will all enjoy, I'm sure you will all enjoy this uh, morning. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Zagier here. It's not the first time that he spoke in Brussels, and hopefully not the last. Uh, to give a kind of snapshot of Professor Zagier, he's both professor at the Collège de France and co-director of the Max Planck Institute. If there was some probability, you can say that this is the intersection between two very restricted groups with certainly turned fair tribute of its mathematical talent. Uh, it's also fashionable these days to go on internet and look at a large number of numbers supposed to define uh, the quality of mathematics. I, I'll just give one which is uh, not you, not you, you. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Zagier's work has been used by at least 1,600 different mathematicians. And I think that shows the breadth of uh, his expertise and his influence in contemporary mathematics. So, his title today is the multiple zeta function at some sorry, of Euler, a link between number theory, geometry, and mathematical physics. So, thank you very much. It's uh, nice to be defined as the intersection of two disjoint sets. <laughs> 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 well, they aren't disjoint because I'm the intersection. <laughs> but, uh, so, I should, for peut-être que je m'excuse auprès de ceux qui auraient très très mal. La langue française m'a assuré que le choix était fait et que j'étais anglophone aujourd'hui. I should perhaps also apologize if I seem a little uh, wobbly. We had a wonderful meal last night with a lot of wine, and it wasn't perhaps a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll do my best to uh, remain upright and keep you awake in the air conditioning that seems to be working out will help. But I can take off my jacket, of course, take off the results if you have one. So, this is going to be very informal, partly because the two hours I meant to prepare very carefully, I was struggling with the hangover instead. <laughs> so, it will be an informal lecture, and that means that if you want to interrupt, you not only can, but you will make me very happy. So, if anything is unclear, or you just wonder about the connection to any, any other field, speak up and perhaps at the end anyway we can have a little time for for questions so the title today um, well there were so many elements that i've forgotten all of them but perhaps the most important word was euler who's my big hero because he lived at a time when you could do mathematics without motives and schemes and so on uh, there were a lot of numbers in what he did and and number theories, but I still feel that number theory is more about numbers than about theory. So I want to talk about these uh, special sums, which I'll call Euler sums today. They have many other names. They're also called, I usually call them multiple zeta values. And then I always make this joke when I talk about it. It's, it's not a joke. I'm very happy that some people who talk about them or who write papers about them call them or the Zagier sums. So I only wish that, you know, I had a joint paper with Euler. <laughs> um, pretty old, but not quite old enough for that. So these are generalizations of the usual safe values, and so I'm going to start with them. 
And so I'll start with, uh, with this function, say that s. So I imagine everybody has seen that thing written down. And everybody has also seen the name of it. It's called the Riemann zeta function. But as usual in mathematics, things don't have the right name. And the Riemann zeta function, Riemann wrote a very famous and extremely beautiful paper about this in 1859. But this function was uh, discovered by Euler in about 1734 and studied and actually all of its main properties were found by Euler. The only thing that he didn't discover, that Riemann discovered, was the Riemann hypothesis, which of course we don't know how to prove. On the other hand, he also discovered the functional equation, I'll cover that, which he couldn't prove, and Riemann did. So I'm going to start with the ordinary zeta function, but as this word shows you, I'm not really talking about functions today, I'm talking about values, about numbers. So we're not going to be interested in, for instance, the Riemann hypothesis, which tells you what happens here when s is a complex number, but just exactly what Riemann was, what Euler was originally interested in, for instance, the value of zeta of 2. So I imagine if I ask for a poll, who knows the answer that essentially everybody, perhaps everybody would have seen the formula which Euler discovered around 1734. It is certainly one of the most beautiful formulas in mathematics, so that the sum of the squares, the sum of the reciprocal of the squares of all positive numbers is pi squared over 6. And this problem made him, he was still a young man, well, in his mid-twenties, it made him extremely famous because that problem had been around for a long time. It had been noticed by, I think, Johannes Bernoy, I'm not sure I know which Bernoy, almost 50 years earlier, that this sum, 1 plus 1 quarter, plus 1 ninth, and so on, converges, so it's, it's some number, and if you just do, you know, if you take the first 50 numbers and calculate them, you find that it's around 1.6 or 1.65, but that's not enough to identify it, and nobody had any idea what this number was. The proof that it converges is very easy. You say that 1 over n squared is less than 1 over n times n minus 1, so ignoring the first term, you can see that this thing is less then 1 over 1 times 2 plus 1 over 3 times 3, and so on. And this thing is 1 minus a half, and this is a half minus a third, and so on. And so this is a telescoping series whose value is 1. So one can see, you know, that's a one line argument that the series converges and its value is less than 2. And Euler, as I say, became very, very famous. That really what made his reputation, made him a uh, famous all over Europe before his other millions of applications may be more famous. And uh, so I always tell this story, I don't know how many of you know a little bit about the story of Euler and the Riemann, so-called Riemann zeta function, but there were three steps. And the three steps somehow to me are very, very significant. The first step is you have to calculate. So the question was, what is the sum 1 over n squared? This was the Basel problem because it was imposed by the Bernoulli family in Basel. And so the first thing he did is he calculated this. Let's just call this S. Calculate S. So I say if you just add up the first you know, 50 numbers, it's very, very tedious. You start on one and then a quarter and a, and a ninth. Uh, you know, and if you write 50 numbers like this, it's almost impossible not to make a mistake. For example, you get a very poor value because you already see easily from this that if you take 50 terms, you'll be off by about you know, 1 over 50, roughly, So, of that order. So you might get you know, two digits beyond the decimal, like 1.65, but you won't get much further. But he calculated S to around 20 decimals, obviously without any kind of a computer, even a calculating machine. So to do that, of course, there's some theory. This is purely numerical mathematics. But he had to invent a theory. He invented what's now called the euler maclaurin summation formula. So that where his contemporaries only knew that this was 1.6 something, he could find that it was actually, I don't remember it by heart, I think it starts 1.6449. Then he made a whole bunch of digits. <coughs> so then he was at least in a good position uh, to, to know what was the wrong answer, because for instance, it couldn't be a one, one and two thirds, for instance. Then, another stroke of genius, not everybody could do this. 
recognize this number. He just looked at this, I don't know how long he looked at it, it's not recorded, and he said, aha, I know that number, that's pi squared over 6. <laughs> and then, well, of course, even he didn't know pi squared over 6 to 20 digits, but once you guess that maybe it's pi squared over 6, you can calculate pi squared very common. Pi was known to many more decimals. Squaring the number to 20 digits isn't that much work, divided by 6, and if all 20 digits agree, then, of course, you feel pretty confident. And then, of course, he proved it, but he proved that actually then here's the uh, later. So, uh, and we have to develop new ideas to do that. But somehow I like the fact that there was a numerical thing, uh, part which depended just on pure love of numbers, and then the theoretical part came at the end. So I'll come back to this proof. Maybe, well, actually, maybe I give it right now. I want to be very rigorous because I'll follow the way he did it. Essentially, so you look at the sine function. The sine function has an expansion that we all know, because Euler found it, and so we now all know it. So it's the alternating sum of x to the n over n factorial with n ranging over the odd numbers. So it's got rational coefficients. And now what he did is he said this function vanishes, of course, at zero. Uh, so this isn't how it looks, it looks like this, or at least it used to. Uh, so student, it vanishes at zero, it vanishes at pi, it vanishes at minus pi, and it's an even function. So what he said is, let's say that we have a function which vanished at just zero, one, and two, and minus one and minus two. Well then, what function would do that? We need the function x times x plus one times x minus one times x plus two times x minus two, or up to a constant, you would also say it's the function x times one plus x times one minus x times one plus x over two minus one minus x over two. So you could say the function which has zeros at zero plus or minus one plus or minus two has this front expansion, x times one minus x squared times one minus x squared over four and so on. Now if instead the zeros were at pi, two pi, minus pi, two pi, then you'd have to put pi's all over the place. And then you would have the same, but it would now look like this. So he just uh, said, well, this function has, uh, has zeros at all of these multiples of pi, so it's zero and then plus or minus pi, plus or minus two pi, uh, plus or minus, I'm probably doing this wrong, I don't know, maybe it's right, three pi, and so on. So it's this infinite product. So if I just start, then I see that this starts x. And now when I multiply up this product, I'll get 1 minus x squared over pi squared times 1 plus a quarter plus a ninth, which was exactly our sum x. And so we see that our thing starts like this, and that shows that indeed the pi squared over 6 is 8 of 2. And in fact, this goes on, and you find that all of the, if I continue this, maybe I'll do that in, in a minute, you find what he found more generally, still at around 1735, that also say to 4 is a multiple of 5 to the 4, say to 6 is a multiple of 5 to the 6, the rational multiple, and so on. Every even power, every even value of say to, I mean, say to s, or every even value of s, is always 5 to the s times some rational number. So that was an absolutely beautiful discovery and remains uh, still today. It was something very exciting. On the other hand, he also calculated say the three to a lot of decimals by the same method. So again, lots of decimals and say the five. And then he wrote in his paper, I haven't been able to find any form that, as far as I can see, there isn't one, but it's a good question for math we to the future. And we're still at exactly the same stage today. There doesn't seem to be a formula. We don't know essentially anything about say the three. For instance, it's known, thanks to update e, that it's an irrational number, but we don't know whether, like the even values, it's pi q becomes a rational number. So nobody believes that. I mean, to, if you calculate it to 10,000 digits and divide by pi q, it sure doesn't look like a rational number. And there are very good ways to recognize rational numbers, too, if you have one. So it's, uh, it's certainly not, but nobody can prove that. So we haven't advanced much beyond the order in that respect. So these are the numbers that the whole thing starts with. And maybe while I'm doing this, I'll say a little more about these values because they actually lead to the multiple set of values in a very natural way. Oh, this is not, it's very easy to do, but it doesn't do anything. Is there a, here, 
Yeah. This one one probably has to make wet. And then one has to dry it. <laughs> Is there a thing to dry it? Is there a... No? Then I'm going to solve the problem because this works well, we can hope. I guess I can... Usually one should be formless as long as possible, but maybe now it's better to erase them and let it dry. So, so I'll use the other board. But maybe it's going to be okay. Okay, so let me show you two proofs that I like very much. First, there's a modern proof uh, that is now 30 or 40 years old due to Eugene uh, Malavi, who's a differential geometry but also loves lovely here. And he found a beautiful proof, which I'll give just because it's fun. So let's do it slightly differently. If I take, say, the 2 and I multiply it by 3 quarters, that means that I'm taking the sum of 1 over n squared, but I'm subtracting the sum 1 over 4n squared. The 4n squared is just the square of 2n, so I'm removing all the odd squares. So this is simply the sum of the reciprocals of all odd numbers, the square. So if I can compute this, I mean, it's not very hard to divide by 3 quarters at the end. So can I be said, well, 1 over 2n plus 1, uh, we can write, you have to be differential geometry to think of this. Let's rewrite one in some simpler way. So he said, well, that's very easy. We just write one as the integral from 0 to 1 dx. And that was so much fun that you do it again. Again, oh, sorry. Uh, that wouldn't even be right. Even differential geometry can calculate that. <laughs> Not even, especially. The number theorists that you just saw can. So you write one like that. But then you write a third as the integral of x squared dx, which is uh, x cubed over 3 from 0 to 1. That gives a third, and so on. And you continue, and you'll get, you know, pretty obvious now, x to the 2 n dx times y to 2 n dy. And so uh, if we put this all together, let's, uh, everything is positive, so there are no problems of converts. If it converts at all, which it does, it converts absolutely. I can interchange as I want. So now I have the double integral, dx dy. And now if I look what I'm integrating, I'm integrating 1 plus x squared y squared plus x to the fourth y to the fourth plus x to the 2n y to the 2n. That's a geometric series. And the sum is this. So, so far, you don't have to be Calabi to do that. That's very easy. But now comes the thing which is uh, really brilliant. And I asked him when he showed me this proof many years ago how he thought of it, and he said, well, that's just obvious. But I still have no idea how he thought of it, <laughs> and I probably never will. But anyway, it's obvious. So let's write this as the integral over the square, and I'm going to change it into the integral over the triangle, where by square, I mean the unit square. So x goes between 0 and 1, and y goes between 0 and 1. And by triangle, I mean a right angle triangle, these for uh, coordinates u and v, uh, but here I'll choose the side to be pi over 2 and pi over 2. So this is a right angled triangle with the uh, sides pi over 2 and uh, I thought use pi over the square root of 2. And now he makes the substitution which he said is just obvious. So here, what do we have? We have u and v are positive, if I look at the interior, and u plus v is less than pi over 2. So that means that u is less than pi over 2 minus v. But if you think of the sine curve, well, the sine is a monotone function between 0 and pi over 2. So the sine of u is going to be less than the sine of pi over 2 minus v, which is the cosine of v. So therefore, if I take sine u and divide by cosine v, well, then it's certainly between 0 and 1. And let's call it x. And similarly, if you take sine v, it's completely symmetric, and divide by the cosine of u, well, it's also between 0 and 1. So we can call it y. And with a little work, you, you check that this is really a nice amorphous on the interior of the, um, the, the edge gets a bit messed up, but the interior of this triangle goes to the interior of this square. But now, when you make a change of variables, you have to replace dx dy by du dv times, and then there's a little matrix, which is you have to take the dx by du, dx by dv, dy by du, dy by dv, take your determinant. And when you do that, it turns out that the value of that determinant is exactly 1 minus x squared y squared. So your new integral, isn't that nice? It's just the integral of the function 1. Well, everybody knows how to integrate 1. If you integrate 1 over a triangle, you just get the area of the triangle 
and so it's pi squared over eight, and now you divide by three quarters, and there's your pi squared over six. <laughs> so that's the wonderful proof of Kalabi, and it has absolutely nothing to do with today's lecture, but I <laughs> nothing. Okay, but now we want to go further. How do we get the higher values, a to four, a to six? Well, there are two ways, and let me do first, well, both use ideas which I'm going to keep coming back to. So there's, I will learn very quickly, but I'll get it eventually. So there's a rule in mathematics, at least in my mathematics, I tell it to all of my friends, and so everybody always laughs when I say it, but it's a good rule. If you have, I'll write it down, the rule. If you have a sequence of numbers, So somebody just gives you some numbers that you want to study, like in this case, z of 2, z of 4, z of 6, but it could be anything. You have a sequence of numbers that you want to make progress and uh, understand and recognize, you have no idea, they're just numbers given by some form, that they come from somewhere in mathematics or in physics. Then you should always do the same thing. You should always form a generating function. And this rule is no exception. I'm not saying it will always work. I mean, there are cases where you don't see how to do it in a useful way, or if you, if you do it, you know, it doesn't seem to bring anything. The vast majority of the time it helps, but you always should try. So this is the absolute rule, and not, maybe not everyone knows that. Where the generating function, this would be a typical generating function. You start with the sequence 1, 1 6, well, I can pick the sign or not pick the sign, 120, and so on, 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. So the sum of the reciprocals of the old factorials. And if for some reason I want to understand that form, that sequence well, well then I would make the generating function, I would make the sum. But let's say I just want to understand the sequence n factorial, then I would multiply these numbers. These are, let's call these numbers a n, n is 0, 1, 2, and so on. Then I make the sum a n x to the n. So you make a series in a free variable x, just a power series, it may converge, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and you look whether studying the properties of that function might not help. So if you want to understand the numbers n factorial, then you use uh, this, which of course we know by order, it's e to the x. And for instance, if you want to know the asymptotics of n factorial, which uh, in this learning formula, I think Euler also found, well, you could write, there's a standard form, the Cauchy integral to write the n coefficient of the thing as an integral, and if you write out that integral and approximate, you immediately get Sturgeon's formula. So for instance, if that was the question you wanted to ask, then, or if you wanted to prove, well, it's obvious here, but if you want recursive form of these, of course we see it here. If this is a n, then it's pretty clear that if I multiply n by a, a n by n, I cancel the n and the n factorial, so I get one over n minus one factorial. So you see this recursion, but that just translates into this differential equation. So if we hadn't seen that differential, if we didn't know the recursion, we would get it immediately. Or if you take the Fibonacci numbers, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, etc. Well, 0, 1, 1. You would make a generating function which would be x plus x squared plus 2x cubed plus 3x to the fourth, 5x to the fifth, and so on. And you would use the defining property Fibonacci numbers that each one is the sum of its two predecessors. And then you would find uh, very quickly this formula. And then if you factor that quadratic thing into its two quadratic factors, you'll immediately get a closed formula for the Fibonacci numbers. So this is a rule you should use everywhere in life. So here we already have a generating function, but it's a little awkward because the nice function to deal with in mathematics should always be a sum. Products are extremely difficult. And so there's sort of an obvious way to change the sum into an integral. So, uh, it, uh, sorry, a sum a product into a sum, it's the wine speaking, namely the <laughs> log of a product is the sum of the logs. So if I take the log of this thing, so we could, uh, I don't know, the best way to do it, I could take, for instance, x divided by sine x and write this as the product 1 over 1 minus x squared over n squared. Well, there's a pi squared here, so maybe I'll put the pi here so that I don't have to keep writing about the extra pi's. So if we write down the same thing this way, then if I take the log of this, then here I'll get the sum of the logs of this thing, and now we use the form that you naturally to Euler, who else, that the, the log of 1 over 1 minus x 
gives x, which here is x squared over n squared, plus x squared, which here is x to the fourth over n to the fourth over 2. So I'm using the formula log, let me call it 1 over 1 minus t, is t plus t squared over 2 plus t cubed over 3. And so on, of course, the formula is trivial to prove this by differentiating both sides and you get on the right of geometric series. So if you apply this to this thing with t being x squared over n squared, then you get, uh, you get this expansion. But now we're already done because this is exactly zeta 2 times x squared plus zeta 4 times x to the 4 times over 2 plus zeta 6 x to the 6 over 3. I'm sorry, I'm running out of space here. And so you see that now we've done what the rule says. We've made a generating function where not just zeta 2, which was the first number, but all of our numbers, zeta 2, zeta 4, and zeta 6 appear. And now uh, it's clear that if you take this thing, if I divide this by x, then we have all rational coefficients. If I take the log of this, and take the log of this, and apply the same formula now with t equal this expression, I'll get something with rational coefficients completely explicit. And so I see that this thing up to that claim is applied that I took out the rational coefficients, as that tells me that, for instance, eight of x up to a factor pi to the six is a rational number. And that's how, that's exactly what Euler did. Of course, the details take a few minutes to work out, or maybe at the time it took a few weeks, because the techniques weren't as advanced. So that's one way to do it, and I'm going to keep coming back to this theme of, uh, of generating functions because that's how you study numbers. But let me give you a different way, which is also very uh, cute. I'm just going to give one case. So I want to prove Euler's formula for zeta 4, but this formula is not going to have a pi in it. So it's not going to be this form. But remember, we already had that zeta 2 is pi squared over 6. So if you believe that, then another way of saying this is that zeta 4 is a rational multiple, not of pi to the fourth, but of zeta 2 squared. So, and the rational multiple is in fact two fifths. So here's a form in which there are no pi's at all. It follows from the two forms that Euler proved for zeta 2 and zeta 4. But now it's a form that stands on its own two feet, as they say about formulas. And so the question is can we find a way of seeing why this is true? without these trigonometric things, or without uh, Calabi, even clever trigonometric things, and in particular with no pi's. Trigonometry means circles, and pi means circles, and so it's not that surprising that we used sines and cosines to get the, the formula with pi. But now this is purely combinatorial, and it's mathematics that seems to like to rise by itself. <laughs> so can we do this in some way? So the following proof, which I hope you like, is due to me. I define. So this is the proposition, and now comes proof. We define the function as follows. It's a really easy function, very elementary, but I'm not going to really explain quite why you write down this function, not some other function. You have to write down the right function. So here it is, 2 over m cubed n plus 1 over m squared n squared plus 2 over n, n cubed. So this is, as I say, this is my proof. So I wrote this down. If you ask me, how did I write it down? Like As and Kalabi, how you found this? Well, for reasons that you'll see very shortly, it's not a bad idea to have the denominators 1 over n to something, n to something, because then we do sum over, for instance, all positive m and n. Well, here you'll get 1 over n squared to say 2. 1 over n squared is again say 2. This part would give us 1 over say 2 squared. Uh, say 2 squared. But why these numbers 2, 1, and 2? Well, of course, I didn't know what they would be. I put a, b, and c. And then you'll see in a minute that the proof only works if you put uh, 2, 1, and 2. So now you do the following calculation. So this is completely elementary mathematics. I take f of n, n, and I subtract from it two things. The first thing, I leave n unchanged. I replace m, uh, n by the sum of the two numbers. And then I could do the, the other way. So I could also say I leave n unchanged, but I replace n by the sum of the two numbers. So you now just compute this. Well, this is, is really high school uh, algebra. You can certainly, everybody can do it. So you take this mess, and you take this mess, so there are three terms here, three here, and three here. We have nine terms. And a priori, all of these terms will have a denominator, which has the form 1 over n to the something n to the something, and n plus n to the something, because of here. So you can put everything over a denominator, I guess it's sufficient to put the denominator n cubed 
n cubed and n plus n cubed. But then you have these three coefficients that I chose to be 2, 1, 2 to make it work, but originally they were free. So you can change that polynomial upstairs. And it turns out you can change it to make it exactly cancel the m plus n cubed. And when you do that, well, the answer is what I'm now writing down. It's this. And so the point of this special choice is that with this choice, with any choice at all, this f of n, m plus n, with the denominator with powers of n and of n, and, well, in this case, just of n and of m plus n. So this would be 1 over n to the something, m plus n to the something. This would also be 1 over n to the something, m plus n. But now I've chosen my coefficients so that they're all of the uh, you know, the numerator is also divisible by n plus n cubed. So I get this identity. So that's the first step. The first step was to define this function. The second, to check this identity. And the last step, and then we're finished, we just have to do it, is to sum over all positive numbers, over all positive integers. So let's do that. Well, on the left hand side, you get the sum f of n, n, where n and n are both positive, because that's where I'm summing over. But then I subtract f of n, n, let's call this n prime, so we don't get confused. n prime, which is m plus n, is the sum of n of a strictly positive number, so it's strictly bigger. Uh, it's strictly bigger than n, and therefore, here, if I rename this n prime to n, I'm summing over m and n positive, but n is bigger than n. Here. And similarly here, this m, called this m prime, is bigger than this m. So here I'm summing, so the left-hand side of my sum is this sum. So what am I doing? I'm summing over all positive numbers, n of n, so in the open upper quadrant. But then think of the diagonal here, n equals n. I'm subtracting all the points under the diagonal, and I'm subtracting all the points over the diagonal. So what's left is just the diagonal. Right? I'm subtracting everything which was where n is either bigger than n or less than n. So I'm left with only terms where n equals n. But if n equals n, then this term is 2 over n to the fourth. This is 1 over n to the fourth. This is 2 over n to the fourth. 2 plus 1 plus 2 is 5. So that's 5 over n to the fourth. And so this thing is 5 zeta 4. But the left hand side, the right hand side, is 2 times the sum 1 over m squared n squared. <coughs> and so it's 2 zeta 2 squared. And so I'm done. 5 zeta 4 equals 2 zeta 2 squared. So it's a very, very simple proof. And this you can generalize to higher numbers if you want to do, uh, let's say, zeta of 20, let's say, instead of zeta 4, so any even power, you would do exactly the same. You start 2 over m to the 19th times n. So the total range should be your even number here, is 4. And then you continue down, so m to the 19th n, m to the 18th n squared, all the way up to n, m to the 19th. And you put the coefficients 2. All of them are 1, which that turns out to be the simplest choice that works. And the last one, you choose a 2 again. And if you do this, if you try it out at, at home, uh, you will find that it really works. And the same marvelous cancellation happens. It's quite easy because this is then a geometric series. You can do this fairly easily. And you get a proof inductively that each set of 2k is a, multi a sum of combinations of previous set of 2k's. And so by induction, you find that they're all rational multiples of set of 2 to the power k. So that's uh, the part I want to tell about the actual zeta, the classical zeta function. And I seem to be far from, I didn't even define the order sums of multiple zeta bytes, but actually I have. Because here it is. Here I'm summing over n, or, or here, I'm summing not just over all integers, but I'm summing over integers in, with this restriction. Uh, this is n and n and here's alphabetical order for you this way. If you take, for instance, actually, I like the first picture better. So let me write here less than n, less than n, still respecting alphabetical order. And now let's say that I took something here, n cubed, n to the second. Well, if I didn't have the restriction that n is bigger than n, if I just was summing over n and n both positive, this would be zeta of 3 times zeta of 7. But no, it isn't. It's a new number. And this one I'll call a double zeta value. It's, it's, it's a value, but it depends on two parameters. Before we were talking about single zeta values, which were the Riemann or so-called Riemann or Euler zeta function. 
So this is a typical double saving value, and similarly, I think you can easily imagine that you know if I put uh, L squared n cubed n to the seventh with uh, L less than you know, all positive, but in increasing order, then this would be called say the p twenty seven, and it's called a triple saving value. So this is called DCB, not not done so here, but it was double L, beta, triple zeta value, and so on. Then in general, be multiple. So these are the multiple zeta values for the order sums. Uh, that, that I want to talk about. And the really amazing thing about them to me, I mean, I first discovered them for myself uh, about more than, certainly more than 25 years ago, in some totally random context that I won't even say. And then I kept bumping into them and I sort of fell in love with them and started uh, trying to find identities and talking about them and lecturing about them. Then I found out at some point that Euler had also looked at them in the case of the double seated values at them. But the really amazing thing is that they just keep popping up in the world of mathematics and also theoretical physics and also, as I mentioned in the title, geometry. So these numbers, which look, they're very, very elementary to find, but they come up in a huge variety of contexts, which I won't certainly be able to talk about all of them. And actually, the geometry, in particular, they come up in the theory of knots, the so-called Vasily invariance of knots, the Konsevich invented a wonderful way to study those invariants, now called the Konsevich integral, and those invariants then turn out to be combinations of these multiple zeta values. So these come up in a very, very direct and specific way in the, trying to distinguish one classical knot from another. But as I said, I won't, that won't be a thing today. Or at least, not that well. so, so these are the numbers we want to study, and the question is, what can you say about them? So let's, I want to uh, start, uh, maybe until we'll make some, some kind of a brief pause after one hour so that you can breathe and also read if you want to read, or, or, or call your friends and have them come, if, you know, whatever. But uh, so in, until the pause, maybe I'll concentrate on double zeta values and try to say something about them, and then I'll say something about multiple zeta values. Second, it won't be more advanced, it'll just be more variables. So you want to study these numbers. And so the first thing you would like to do, if you remember Euler's uh, way, you first calculate, and then you recognize, and then you prove. Well, I'm a little weak on the last bit, but I'm, I'm good at, at just writing computer programs and calculating numbers. So when I first learned about the existence of these numbers, I said I discovered it myself and only learned later that they've come up many times before in mathematics. The first thing you want to do is calculate them. So if you imagine calculating this, let's say I want to calculate this like Euler did to 20 digits, or since I have a computer, maybe I'd like 2,000 digits. Because after all, Euler, his number was very easy, it was pi squared over 6. So even 20 digits, you know, for such a simple answer, you can recognize. But imagine that this, you know, when we have lots of indices and lots of exponents, you can imagine that the relations, if there are relations, are going to become quite complicated, and they do, with big coefficients and big numbers. And so even to recognize, you're going to need a lot more than 20 digits. So typically, you might like 500 or 5,000 digits. But if you calculate this directly, you'll have the same problem that the Renewis had, that it, it converts extremely slowly. So if you want 1,000 digits on this, you would need roughly uh, 10 to the 2,000 computer operations. So let's say 10 to the 7 per year, that gets you down to 10 to the 1,000. 993, and then you take the age of the universe, and then you're down to 10 to the 1,986, but it's not ever going to get down to something you can do. So the first question is, how can you compute them? And I don't want to talk about, just take my word for it, you can. So these numbers, so the, maybe just, I'm sure that this definition is enough that you see what, what I mean by the general notation, but I'll write it anyway, just to, to put my constant at rest. Uh, so the multiple zeta value in general, I put it increasing, but some people, including me and some other papers, maybe decreasing. It's just a question of convention. Uh, so the zeta value is defined like this, and as I said, that series converts extremely badly. Well, to be precise, if ks were one, it wouldn't converge at all because I would end with one over m. That's a famous divergent sum. So we want that all of the k's are at least one, but the last one better be at least two. So let's call that an admissible index or admissible k, uh, tuple. 
So we want to calculate this and just take my word for it that there's an excellent inductive procedure. It's very, very easy to do. And my program in fact, is three lines long, three or four lines long, and it calculates the you know, even number with 15 or 20 arguments in, let's say, one second to 1,000 digits. So I mean, there's no problem computing these numbers once you've seen the right way. So then you try to recognize them. So let me start with a little table. So first of all, if I fix k, k is called, uh, k is the sum of the k's, and this is called the weight. And it's the most important invariant. Well, there are two important invariants. One is the length, it's usually called the depth. So simple say this is our depth one, this is depth two, this is depth three, I mean it's the number of indices. But even more important here, so this would be depth three, you know, there are three indices, but even more important, two plus three plus seven is 12. So this particular number would have weight 12. So if you fix k, well, it has to be at least two, otherwise you'll never be able to write this as sum of numbers, which one is at least two. Well, then there, are, there exists exactly, that's very easy to check, two to the k minus two multiple zeta values of that weight. I mean, it's just always of writing k, but let's uh, improve that. Here's uh, the, the last one has to be at least two, but otherwise you can put, you know, interrupt and you start from zero to k, and you put little dots anywhere you want, except that the last thing the last bit is two. So each place you either put it or not, that gives you two to the k minus two ways, and then you just read off k1, k2, or the lengths of these intervals. So there are two to the k minus two, and let's look at this. So here's k, and here's uh, here are the zetas, multiple zeta values. So if I have two, there's only one. It's eight of two, and we already know what it is. But now I don't even care that it's five squared over six, it's just whatever it is, it's just a of two. But if we continue, so let's do three and four, I can just write it all down. So for three, there are two ways. You either take one plus two, remember the last one has to be at least two, or you take the uh, three. And similarly for four, you can have one, one, two, or one, three, or two, two, or uh, four. And for five, there are eight ways and so on. So those are the numbers. And let me just make sure I don't get it the wrong way around. Then, well, let me express this. This thing, here's a nice formula. It's one times eight of two. That's, of course, not very surprising. Uh, this one is 1 times 8 of 3, also not very surprising. But this one is also 1 times 8 of 3. That's Euler. So as I say, Euler was the first person to study these, and he proved, I'll give his general theorem in a moment, but the first special case in his general theorem would say that zeta of 1 comma 2 is exactly zeta of 3 on the nose. Now here when you do it, let's say first just from the computer, you find that this is 1 times 8 of 4, this of course also 1 times 8 of 4, but this one I just look, and I always forget, one of them is one quarter and one is three quarters, and I'm incapable of remembering it. Uh, this one is one quarter of zeta four, and this one is three quarters of zeta four. So each of these is some beautiful identity that you, know, you can try to sit down and prove, and up to here, if you try, uh, I can more or less guarantee success. If you think about it long enough, you will see some trick and you will be able to prove each of these uh, formulas. So we see something, well, we see an obvious conjecture, which is that every multiple zeta value, zeta of k one to k, so is just a rational multiple of zeta of k, where k is the total weight. That guess, however, is uh, soon disproved, because when you come to the next case, I'm not going to give the list, but if k equals 5, then we have, well, of course we have zeta of 5, but we also have zeta of 2, 3. And now maybe I'll put this on another board and come back. It's so important. Remember the argument we used for this proof. We took the sum over all m and n, and then every pair of m and n, two positive integers, strictly positive integers, either n was bigger than n, or n was smaller than n, or n was equal to n. So if I write the sum n n positive of anything, then the sum n less than n, or n less than n, or and equal to n. There are only three possibilities. And I can put anything at all that I want here. So in particular, I can put 1 over n to the a, n to the b, and here, 
of the same. So here, this is, these are just independent sums. So here I get say of A times A to B. But here, I get this A to KB. That's exactly the definition. Here I get say of BA. And the last term, we already used that argument. If N equals N, then this is 1 over N to the power A plus B. And so I get A, say of a plus B. So here's a beautiful general formula that should, this is called the first shuffle relation. You've already guessed that this is the second shuffle relation. So the shuffle relation. Uh, shuffle, it's, unless you're a card player, you might not know that English word. It's a very rare one. It's a mélanger, mélanger les cartes, mission. So it means, you know, imagine you have a deck of cards. Here are some cards. And you take half of it in one hand and half of the other, and you, and, and you mix them up. So if you do that, they get mixed up in some order that depends how quickly you go up and down. But the order of the left hand part will always be the same, the order of the right hand part is the same. Here you can't really see it, but uh, actually you can't see it at all here. But when you come to the general shuffle relation, which this is a special case, you'll see that I'm doing something where I'm mixing up the order in all ways. So here it's a really stupid shuffle. I'm the deck of two cards. One of them is labeled with an A, and one is labeled with B. And so when I shuffle, well, either A comes before B or it comes after B, and so that's those two. But when we generalize, then you'll have here, so let me, well, I can generalize right away. Say that I took Z of 5 times A of 3, 4. Well, I could do the same. I could say this is 1 over L to the fifth, and this is 1 over N cubed N to the fourth with N less than N. Everything is positive. And now, you can really think, now I have three cards. One of them is labeled 5, and two of them are labeled 3 and 4, but the 3 is always above the 4. So however I shuffle, the n cube will always come before the n to the 4th, because n is less than n. So when I multiply this sum by this sum, 1 over l to the 5th times 1 over n cubed n to the 4th, well, l might be less than n, which is then less than n, so in that case, I would have 1 over L to the fifth m cubed n to the fourth. I'd get 5 to the fourth. Or L might be in between m and n, in which case I'd get m cubed L to the fifth n to the fourth, but L is not in between. So I would have 3, 5, 4. Or it might come at the end. And then 3, 4, 5. Now, if I underline this uh, in some dark colors, you can see. And I put here a dotted line on those. Then you see that I'm mixing them up in all ways, but the three is always to the left of the fourth. It's just like when you shuffle cards. But this isn't quite right, because this is when L is less than N. Here's when L is strictly between M and N. That's when L is greater than N. But L might also be equal to N. And so that, in that case, we have 5 plus 3 uh, and 4, or L might be equal to N. Then we have M cubed and L to the ninth. So all together, we get these terms. So this is the general first shuffle relation. And what it tells you is that the product of any two multiple zeta values can be written in a very, very explicit and algorithmic way as a positive integer linear combination of other multiple zeta values. So in particular, the space of all these multiple zeta values forms a ring. So now going back to five, I see that if I take zeta of two, zeta of three, plus zeta of three, two, so that's certainly in my space, then I'll get zeta of five, or minus zeta of five, plus zeta of two times zeta of three. But everybody, all mathematicians believe that zeta of 5 has nothing to do with zeta of 3. It's certainly not the rational multiple of 5 squared times zeta of 3. So these two numbers are independent. And in fact, when you go to the computer, you find that here there were four numbers. The next time there are eight. All eight of the numbers you get, zeta of uh, any multiple zeta value of weight 8, turns out to be a linear combination of these. So in other words, what we found is that for weight 2, 3, or 4, there's only one. All multiple zeta values are just, it's a one-dimensional vector space. So they're just multiples of zeta of k. But here it's a two-dimensional vector space. In weight 5, everything is a multiple. So this is, uh, let's call it zeta 5 for zk. I'll write it in formal mathematical notation. It's the sum over all k. So this people are just call k underlined k of weight k. So remember the weight is the sum of the k i's. And then I take the multiple zeta value, and I take rational multiples of it and add that all up. So this is some fancy notation for a rational vector space. So it's just a span of all of these. 
So here, zeta five is the Q span. It means all linear combinations of zeta five and zeta two times zeta three. Here, that's actually proved. And so the dimension is at most two, and presumably exactly two, but nobody can prove that these two numbers are not simply rational multiples of each other, but again, to 10,000 digits, they aren't, and we're pretty sure that they aren't. So it looks like the dimension is two. So when you continue this uh, calculation for a while, then what you find is the following table. So I'll go up to 12, because that's how far I learned by, by heart. But this part, I didn't even have to specially study, because it's uh, pretty familiar. The power is 2. I ran out of space. So when we get up to weight 12, you already have 1,024 possible multiple zeta values, right? Here I have 1, here I have 2, here I have 4, for 5, I have 8. But when you look at the dimension of the space, here it was just one dimensional, here it was one dimensional, here it was one, here it was only two dimensional. So it's very, very much smaller. But when you continue doing this, you find that here it's again two dimensional. You can have zeta three squared, or you can have zeta six, which is part of the six, up to rational numbers. When you get to seven, you find that the dimension is three, then it's four, and it's five, seven, nine, and twelve. So it's not true that all of these numbers are just multiples of one fixed number. It's not just, you know, for instance, our zeta of two, three, seven is definitely not, or presumably not going to be just a multiple of say the 12, but still something remarkable is happening. Of 1,024 values, there are only 12 independent ones. So we have to find 1,012 relations. So this is the calculation I did uh, many years ago. And if, I, if you look at these numbers, you'll see very quickly uh, that there's a recursive definition. It's just like Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci numbers, dk would be dk minus 2 plus dk minus 1, some of the two predecessors. And here it's dk minus 2 plus dk minus 3. It's the sum of the two, two before it. So for instance, 5 plus 7 together give you this 12. 4 plus 5 is 9. 3 plus 4 is 7. 3 plus 3 is 5. 2 plus 3 is 4. That's why you know, it's easy to remember these numbers, or if you forget them, to work them out. So up to 12, this formula works. So that was my conjecture. So let's do it the other way. Let me define dk by, by that. So dk is like the notch numbers. It starts 1, 1, or 1, 1, 1. And then you continue by this recursion. And the conjecture that I made many years ago was that the dimensions are the same. Well, as I already said, even for five, you can't prove it. It's not at all hard for five to show that all eight values you get are linear combinations of just these two. But you can't show, as I've already said, that these two are not just rational methods of each other. So all you get for five, uh, when k is five, is that the dimension of zk is less than or of z5 is less than or equal to two. And it's, well, of course, it's at least one if these numbers aren't all zero, but that's all you can prove. And this is what's known today. This is a deep theorem it took about 15 or 20 years after I made the conjecture until it was proved by Terrasomo and also by Dali and Gonchalo. And there's now, there are now several proofs. So we know that this dk is not just a random axis. That really is, surely is the answer. Presumably it's equal. But as I say, in the lower direction, nothing at all can be proved. There are no results at all for any k. On linear dependence. So there's not one single case for which we know that there are even two zetas which are independent. But the way if you compare different k's, then it's believed that there are never any relations. So zeta 3 and zeta 4 must not, that would contradict all conjectures in this area, they must not be rationally dependent. And when you look at the computer, indeed it never happens. So for different weights, there's no mixing, but in a given weight, there's this huge amount of cancellation. So the question is somehow, where does it come from? Well, I'm going to slide up to change what I said because I don't know exactly when we started, but only a few minutes after 10. So if I want to make a pause after an hour, I should make it very soon. So I, I won't finish everything I want to say about double zeta values before the pause. So let me say, uh, however, beginning, there's this first shuffle relation. And so the first shuffle relation, well, as I already said, it tells you that these things form a ring, in other words, if I take some tuple, k1 prime, let's have the k s prime, and then some other tuple up for the double prime, just so I can keep them apart, the underlying means that these are tuples, then this will be a sum of some, as I said, explicit positive integer times the zeta of k for a certain case. It will be a finite sum, 
And the total wave will always be the same. Here plus weight 5 plus weight 7 is weight 12. 5 plus 3 plus 4 is 12. 8 plus 4 is 12. 3 plus 9 is 12. So it will always be a relation in the given wave. But that doesn't yet. You might say, oh, we've already started proving relations. But unfortunately, this isn't, doesn't give any relation. Because this is not a multiple zeta value. It's a problem. This only tells us how to, uh, you know, how to multiply. So it tells us that this, uh, so what it tells us in the language of uh, modern mathematics is that if I make the sum, well, I would like to put direct sum, but we don't actually know that they're destroyed, so I'll just put the sum. Let me define z0 just to be the rational numbers. z1 is just uh, 0, because there aren't any multiple zeta values. zeta2, we already saw, is uh, just q times zeta2. Say z3 is q times z of 3, z4 is q times z of 4, z of 4, z5 is spanned by those two things, etc. So if I add all of these, this is still a vector space in R, since I'm working over the rationals, it's even a ring if I work over the integers, but it's in fact, it's not just a vector space, it's actually a ring or an algebra. So it's close on multiplication, but that doesn't give any relations. All I've shown is that. The product of two multiple zetas is again a multiple zeta. But now it comes, and I'm going to prove this in the second half, which is very easy and really very beautiful. This is second shuffle relation, which is harder to write down, so I won't write it down yet, I'll write it down in a moment in the special case just when the double zetas. There's the second shuffle relation, and it says, well, it looks very, very similar to the first. It says, given any tuple k prime and any second tuple k double prime, <coughs> I don't know why I underline that. I could just do some fancy script lettering and you need to underline. In fact, I did it here. It was spontaneous. Though. So one day do that. It's more, more beautiful than underlining to this kind. There's already a prime and double prime. So let me write a relation which will look very familiar. So I, I sum over certain k's, so total weight, the sum of those two weights. And then there's some explicit integer. Positive again. Explicit positive integer. Times zeta k. So isn't that beautiful? As well as this relation, which says that zeta k prime times zeta k double prime is the sum explicit in times zeta k. We have this completely different formula, which says exactly the same thing, letter for letter. I haven't changed a single letter, only the font changed. But the second, it's a completely different explicit in. So the point is, and this is really a kind of a thing of beauty, there's a completely different way to see then when I multiply zeta 5 times zeta 3, 4, those are just two real numbers. You can compute them on the computer. When you multiply, you get a new real number. And the claim is that that real number is an integer linear combination of other multiple zeta values, all of weight 12. But I showed you a proof. But there's a completely other proof. But it doesn't prove the same formula. It proves a completely different formula, giving a totally different expression for the same product as combination of the same numbers. And now I do have a relation. Because now I don't care that this is a product. It's something, whatever it is, it's the same as what it was before. So if I now use this equality, then this explicit combination of multiple z values is an ex a different explicit combination of multiple z values. So when I subtract them, I have a combination of multiple z values which is not just all the coefficients equal to zero, but something. And so that gives me a relation. And the main conjecture, which is totally uh, open uh, today, it's been the main conjecture since the beginning. It's, by the way, wrong if I'm going to state it well. It's correct if you state it correctly, but if you, I'll be vague enough that I, it's not even wrong, but if you make precisely the obvious way what I'm saying, then it's wrong. You have to be slightly more careful, and I'll say it why in a second. The main conjecture is that the double shuffle relations, so that's what they're called. There's a, a thriller by James Hadley Chase called Double Shuffle, but I only found that after, after I use this word, but it's very cute. Uh, double shuffle relations, that's the combination. It's the relations. This is not really a relation. It's the first. It, it's made the identity. It's how you multiply. And the second shuffle uh, rule for multiplication. So these are two identities. But if I combine them, then I get a relation, which is the double shuffle relation of combining these two shuffles. And that the conjecture is that they suffice. And that's been checked up to much more than weight 12. In other words, if you take your computer and you write down all of the double shuffle relations for everything in weight 12, so you multiply all 
for these double things by all the, uh, sorry, all things of weight seven prints by all things of weight five, you'll get a bunch of things of weight twelve, and you'll get two formulas. Uh, the first and the second. That'll give you a whole bunch of relations. If you do it for all combinations, you'll find, well actually way more than a thousand and twelve relations, but they aren't all independent, but you will find exactly one thousand and twelve independent relations. They will be left with exactly twelve numbers. So by computer up to a high weight, this is true that these the comparison of these two different rates of multiplying is sort of the, the key to the castle. But that, as I say, we don't know how to do. So in the very last part of the, the form of pre-pose, let me write down. And the, re the reason that I said it's not quite right, but I haven't told you, but exactly what it is. If you remember the proof that I gave you before that I was so proud of, I just have an n which started 2 over n cubed n and so on. And then I just casually wrote down the sum f of n n minus the sum f of n n, where it was bigger than n and less than n. But of course, that's completely illegitimate. You were all very polite and nobody complained. But obviously, the sum f of n n alone over all positive numbers n n will be divergent. It's 1 over n cubed converts, but 1 over n is divergent. So I actually lied very slightly. And you have to introduce divergent so, say this nonsense, you have to drop the condition case of these two, allow chaos to be equal to one with some slight interpretation of how you interpret that infinite sum, and there is a nice way to do it, and then the double shuffling relations make sense, uh, even when the last thing, and now you get more relations, and then it suffices. See, otherwise this couldn't possibly be right, because the first conversion zeta is zeta 2. So the first way you can multiply two zetas would be in weight 4. So the first double, true double shuffle relation would be in weight four, but it's only one relation, and we needed three. But you wouldn't get any relations here. But if I'm allowed to multiply zeta of one times zeta of two in the two, two legal ways by the two shuffle relations, but I have to make sense of this infinite one or defined in some formal way, I will get two distinct expressions, which are both renormalized infinite sums, like we do in physics. But now they will each be the sum of an infinite part and a finite part. But the infinite parts are the same, so you can just cancel them, and then the finite parts, one is eight of one, two, and one is eight of three, and you do get your relation. And similarly here, as I said, just by multiplying eight of two with itself, I would only get one relation, I need three. But if I permit myself to take eight of one times eight of three, or eight of one comma one times eight of two, and so on, then I get a bunch of relations, and it's enough. So the correct conjecture would be extended uh, double shelf relations where you allow you know, divergent zetas. Suffice. And that's been checked very far, and the law is known theoretically, but it's still completely unproved. So I want to end this uh, first part, and then I've sort of told you the theory, and then I'll, in the second part, I'll tell you lots of fun special cases and examples, and some connection with, with physics and with counting points. So uh, I just wanted to finish then by writing down the uh, second shuffle relation. Uh, in the case of double zetas. So for double zetas, let me see where I wrote it down. Right. Uh, oh, I wrote it in my, in my notes, that's not right. Me. So, the, so the first shuffle relation, if I just take two numbers, would be that zeta of rs plus zeta of sr would be equal to zeta of r plus s. I'm sorry. Zeta of r times zeta of s minus zeta of r plus s. Right, that was, I mean, the product was zeta of r times zeta of s is this plus this plus zeta of r plus s. That was the first. Now the second double shuffle relation, uh, the problem is that I have two sets of notes and one I, and less than n, the other and bigger than n, and I'm terrified of getting it all backwards. So here, how many relations do I get by the way r? And s have to be at least two, because remember the second order has to be at least two, and they both occur. And then since it's symmetric, you might as well, so here r plus s is k, so this is a with k, and here's a relation of weight k, but the number of independent, well, not a relation, a way to multiply, but the number is only integer part of k over two minus one, because <laughs> I might as well have r less than s by symmetry, and then r has to be at least two for convergence. But the other relation will say, then if I take, uh, now, uh, again the same, I can assume that by symmetry, that I don't know why I called it J and K, it's 
find this. Uh, there's going to be another way to multiply, z of j times z of k minus j. And the other way will be we find our no coefficients. So it's a completely different formula. Here the formula was very short, it's just the two terms, and the coefficients were both one. And well, and the third term is a to k. But when I multiply that just the two or three terms, now I have k minus two terms because s is running from two to k minus one, and the coefficients are going to be sums. Maybe I'll make it look more beautiful. Well, no, okay, k minus j. But think of this as a to j times a to j prime, and then this would be j minus one, j prime minus one. So it's more symmetric than it looks, and. I want the total weight always to be k. So here it would be k minus s, s. So here, the second way of multiplying, I multiply z of j times z of j prime. j and j prime are two numbers which are equal to these two. By symmetry, I might as well assume j is the smaller one, when it's less than k over 2. And then here's a completely different form expressing the product as a different combination. So these are the two shuffle plates, they're completely different. And by comparing them, uh, you'll get this. And if we allow ourselves, to say that j could even be 1 here, then uh, you, can, you can add one term, s equals 1, and then you, you include 1 into the term, but it comes in both of them. And when you subtract these two things, one from the other, you'll find that the term that wouldn't make sense, the one that say that k minus 1, 1, drops out anyway. And so you still get a, a valid shuffle relation. That's this extension I was talking about. So let me end this first part just by proving this. It's a, uh, one line proof, well, up to a verification. So what you do is you use what are called partial fractions. So I'll just call it lemma. But it's very easy to prove. So uh, the lemma says that if I take m to the, I guess I may get j and k minus j mixed up, but I hope it's this way. If I take 1 over m, m and n are just variables, if I take 1 over m to the k minus j, 1 over m to the j, remember the proofs that I gave you, where I started with things like m cubed n and m squared n squared, to make my f, but then I'd f of m comma m plus n. So I replaced one of the variables by, uh, by m plus n, so I do the same here, and I did it in both orders. I also replaced the other one by m plus n. So you can do it in two different ways. Well, again, with, with some inequality here, r plus whatever we need. So it's r, m to the r, m plus m to the s, and here it's m plus m to the s, m to the r. And these are the denominator, and now the coefficients, and the coefficients are s minus 1, j minus 1, and here s minus 1, j minus j minus 1. So this is an identity which for any given k and j, you just, you know, work it out. So the high school algebra, to prove in general, well, you can compare the poles if you know how you do it. Anyway, this is an elementary thing. There are many, many proofs. This is just a finite formula. So here, R, it should be the same inequalities as here. R is at least. Yeah, but N, it doesn't really matter where I put S here. I can say R and S are just positive. You can say here I left out S equals 1, but if S is 1, this is 0 or something, that's always 0. So um, you just start this sum wherever the binomial coefficient is non zero. So this is completely elementary. And now if I just sum this over all m and n positive, but now I'd better assume for convergence that j and k minus j are both at least two, then I would indeed get on one side z of j times a to k minus j. And when I sum this here of m to the r and something big to the s, so this is a of r s, and this one will be z of s r. So you have to interchange the roles that I no, it's, it's, sorry, it's still say the bar is, so I just get exactly the same here. So that, that, I did that a little too quickly, and it was not well prepared. But anyway, you see that it's elementary, but the main thing is that there are two completely different ways of multiplying, and that somehow gives you this whole richness. So let's make a short pause, and then in the second half, I want to tell you some of these zillions of relations. There's some really pretty ones, and that you get by applying this machinery, and then say something about connection to it some other parts of mathematics, maybe physics. So, I don't know what good length of pulse is, long enough to breathe into the... Thank you for the 10 minutes. Yeah. 10 minutes, okay.
Okay, so let's continue and now I'll do what I hope to do the first, but I want to tell you more about double say. And in particular, I'm going to try to show you a sketch in proof of the wonderful theorem that were the found. So already told you that he was the first person to look at these. And I said here the general theorem of which this form which I did earlier is the first special case, but it's a general theorem. And it's really beautiful. And it's this that double say the values of our way. So here the way is three. Can be expressed in terms of single single set. B of double. So this is this theorem. In other words, if you have a plus b plus n is k, which is an odd number, and as usual, a is at least one, b is at least two to make this uh, make sense, then this thing can be written as a sum of some rational number times, well, here I could take zeta of, let's say, s, where s is going to be odd, and here, uh, so it goes up to k, this k itself was odd, and then in front I have an even, uh, you could think of it as zeta of k minus s, but by k minus s is even, and then by others there, it's uh, pi to k minus s. But you can also think of that uh, as a to k minus s. I mean, say to k minus s isn't equal to pi to k minus s, but it's a rational number. So that's the theorem, that you can always reduce. So in other words, the theory of multiple zeta values, uh, if this were always true, if all multiple zeta values could be expressed, there wouldn't be a theory, there'd be nothing to say, uh, but it's not true. Actually, I forgot to say that in my examples, when we looked at weight 2, we had only zeta of 2. 3, we had only zeta of 3. 4, we had only zeta of 4. 5, we had two numbers, but they were simply products. And similarly for 6, I told you, you get only zeta of 3 squared and zeta of 6. So you might have a, a weaker conjecture. Up to here, one might have conjectured it's just zeta of k. Here you say, OK, this, but maybe it's also just always just products. But when you come to 8, then you have zeta of 8, or pi to 8. You have zeta of 3, which is zeta of 5. You have zeta of 2, which is pi squared, times zeta of 3 squared. But those are the only products of Riemann zeta values. But remember that we don't them because I've raised the table, but I mentioned it's actually 4. And you can take practically any other one. It doesn't matter what you take, for instance, 5, 3. But for the first time, you honestly need a multiple zeta value. And as you go up, then in general, the multiple zeta values is way bigger than just products of single zeta values. But in the case of double zetas at odd weight, I want to prove this. So I'm going to sketch the proof because it illustrates the rule. Remember the rule, and if you remember one thing from this lecture and you didn't know it before, some of you surely knew it before, try to remember the rule, which was when you have a lot of numbers and you're interested in studying them, make a generating function. So if I'm interested in all of the double zetas, Uh, of, uh, of say a weight k, then what I should do is I should put them into a generating function. So here, it's just a finite generating function because I'm fixing the weight. So I should put x to the r, y, to the s, but it turns out it works better. Both with generating function, you have to play around a little to make the formulas come out as nicely as possible. And so here, what you want to do is this. So I make a polynomial like this, so for instance, d4 would be zeta of 1, 4 times y squared plus zeta of, oh, sorry, 1, 3 plus zeta of 2, 2 times xy plus zeta of 3, 1 times x squared. And here I have a slight problem because this is actually infinite, but as I've already mentioned, I don't want to go into it. You just allow the divergent sums and you, you keep in mind how they diverge. So just, just take my word for it that you don't have to worry. So, here, S isn't really allowed to be 1, but I'll, I'll allow it anyway. So that's the double zeta. And then we also make another generating function, which is the 
same thing. Oh, but here I'll put z of r times z of s. So double d is for double and p is for product. So I make these two things. And now, what I find is this. If I take d of x, y, the first double, well, I've erased it. Uh, or it's, I, I asked for everything to be erased, now I maybe should have kept one formula. The first self relation is that z of rs plus z of sr is simply z of r times z of s minus z of k. So that means that when I take d of xy plus d of yx, I'm going to get a relation. Namely, d of xy plus d of yx is going to be the sum, the same generating function with the coefficient is now z of rs plus z of sr. But that's simply z of r times z of s, which is what I call pk, which is a k everywhere. Actually, I could drop the k and just do it with power series, but let's keep the k. And then that, that isn't quite true because remember z of r s plus z of s r wasn't quite z of r times z of s. It was that minus z of k times 1. So here you have r plus s equals k. Of course, this is just an easy. Uh, it's just x to k minus 1 minus y to k minus y to x minus y. It's just an easier geometric series. But I don't even care that it's that. The point is that it's known. Right? These, if we assume that the single zeta values are known, and of course we don't know them except numerically, but we consider them as familiar object. So zeta 2, zeta 3, zeta 4, zeta 5, and so on, we consider as known. And we're trying to compute the doubles in terms of those. So we can ignore the known things. So here we can ignore this, these details and just say that this is known. Now, if you take the second double shuffle, then it's been re removed, but maybe you remember that it basically said that z <coughs> r times z of s, or it was actually written z of j times z of some j prime, with some sum of z of r s with binomial coefficients. The binomial coefficients, as their name suggests, are the coefficients of the binomial expansion. So for instance, binomial coefficients, you know, Pascal's triangle, the, the third row is 1, 3, 3, 1, which corresponds to x plus y cubed, which has the generating function x cubed plus x, 3x squared y, and so on. So the binomial coefficients which come into the second shuffle relation are awkward. When I wrote it out as a shuffle relation, it's some messy thing. But as soon as I multiply by x to the r and y to the s, and that's where it's useful, you, I'm sure you don't remember the formula, but there were things like s minus 1 over j minus 1. Everything was shifted by 1. And so, because I've made the same shift here, when you put in the binomial coefficient, then to work out what you get, it turns out that it's extremely simple. And the answer is simply, remember, the double shuffle relation is also a formula for the products. So it told you that uh, p of x, y was equal to something. And what it turns out to be is very, very simple. order right, y is x plus y. So if, if you just write down, if, if you're taking notes, then you can do it tonight. Otherwise, you'll have to start from scratch. But the, the double shuffle, the second shuffle relation was something with binomial coefficients. And when you insert that in, in for sum, multiplied by x to the r minus 1, y to the s minus 1, and uh, that formula, then you'll immediately find this. And it's really a one-line demonstration. So this is, these are the two formulas. And this is, of course, also known. So if you wanted, in Euler's theorem, to get the exact formula, how to express it, which is very easy to do, then you would have to keep track of these, and then the, the calculation becomes a bit messy. But I'll just put you know, a, a check, meaning that it's known. So now, let me show you how to use this. So let's start with dk of xy. When it's equal to minus, I'm going to drop the k in a second. Too much cross, right? It's equal to minus d of yx, and I'll just put congruent, where congruent means that the difference of the left hand side and the right hand side is something known. So, up to known quantities, which I would have to keep track of if I wanted to find a formula, I can just take any d and interchange x and y at the price of putting in a minus sign. But now let's look at this. These are independent variables. So, I could call this x and call this mentally y prime for the moment. But then we can rename it, I mean, it's originally y prime, we can rename it y. 
Then here, you see that the second variable is that y prime, so it's now called y. But the first variable y is the difference, y prime minus x, so after the change of notation, it's y minus xy. So we have the second shell formulation tells me that any d with any two arguments, up to a change of sign and, and up to adding known things, is the negative of, uh, of when you do y minus x and y. So here the negative, the negative is the positive. So here, although now it's going to be very confusing. So the second argument is the old second argument, and the first argument is the different second minus first. So here's x minus y. And now I can just keep playing this game. So now I can, no, it's, each of these is an involution. If you do this twice, it'll come back. So there's no point when I do it, doing it again with the same relation. If I use the first sub relation twice in a row, I'd just get d of xy plus minus d of y x equals d of xy. That would be pointless. But so I use the first, then I use the second. Now if I use the second again, I just go back. So I use the first, but I can use the second. So now it's again plus. And then what's the rule? It's the second argument remains the same. And the first argument is the second minus the first. And then I do it to, I use the first shop formation, so I interchange the two arguments and put a minus sign in front. And I use the second one again, and I get a plus sign. And now the arguments are this. The second argument is what it already was. And the first argument is the second argument minus the first. It's minus y minus x minus y. So it's minus x, and there's a plus sign. And I can put, if I was too lazy to write them all, but I put it in And also, these weren't equalities. It was always congruences, meaning that the difference between the two sides of these equal signs, which are now congruent sides, is a known expression, known meaning that it can be written in terms of either just z of k, or products z of r times z of s, with total weight k. But now, look at the definition of dk. In this definition, r and s add up to k. The total weight is k. So if I change x to minus x, I get a sign minus 1 to the r minus 1. If I change y to minus y, I get a sign s to minus 1. That's minus 1 to the k minus 2, but the minus 1 squared is just 1. So this is equal to minus 1 to the k times dk of x, y. Multiple completely explicit known things. If k is even, this is totally useless. I prove that d of x, y is equal to itself, or rather it's not even equal. I can only show that the difference of it in itself is some elementary expression, but it's actually zero. But if k is odd, I've shown that up to known things, this is equal to minus itself. So I'm doubling it, it's simply zero. And so d of x, y is zero up to known things, which means that d of x, y is known. So it's a really beautiful proof. You do this, uh, you know, six stages of uh, the splitting back and forth, and it's like going around the hexagon. And when you get to the other side, then you've changed, changed the whole sign, and so you've shown you that your thing is actually zero. So that's the proof of Euler's theorem. It's the only proof I'll actually give. So now, the general double shuffle, actually it would be very easy to show you. Maybe at the end, if anyone asks a question, uh, if somebody wants to see. I gave a proof of the, first, of the second shuffle relation at the end of the first hour, just with binomial coefficients, with a sketch of a proof, and that becomes very messy if you try to do it with triples and quadruples edge values. But actually, there's a much better way to do it using integrals, the so-called Greenfeld integral, and then it's very easy to see what's going on. But let me drop that for now. So here we see the structure of odd status. So if I take odd, so k odd, so the, I'm still talking about double z values, then say zk, let me put here double, the uh, two meaning in a depth at most two, then this thing is just spanned by uh, z of a times z of b, where a plus b is k. And since this is odd, I might as well assume that this is even, and this is odd, and of course then at least three, and this is at least two, and, and the sum is k. So that's a complete description, and if we assume, as everybody believes, that these numbers are linearly independent of the dimension of this, is roughly k over two. How what happens if k is even? Well, the first thing that you prove is that ZK2 in this case is spanned by definition. This is the definition. It's spanned by all of the Z of AB with the usual things A is at least 1, B is at least 2, where A plus B is equal to K. Now, because K is even, this is either even, even, or odd, odd. When you check it on the computer, 
you find that when you put even even, there are lots and lots of relations. And actually, some of them we've seen. Because, for instance, when I say the 4 a and say that 8 4, then we already know that this is a to 12. Is a to, is a to 4 times a to 8 minus a to 12. But by Euler, this is a rational number and pi to the 12. So already, when you take the even ones uh, and up to pi to the k, then it's anisometric. So already the dimension drops. It's already k over 2 because they're both even. And now it's k over 4. So there are lots and lots of relations among even even. But when you look on the computer, you find well, there are also relations among the zeta of O, but fewer, and they actually span the whole space. And that's a theorem. So that's proved in the paper by Gano Kadeko and myself a few years ago. But this is not the definition of the fact. Again, the, the, the range is equal to k. So you only need the zeta of odd odd. So you might think, OK, well, how many odd odd are there? Uh, well, roughly, roughly k over 2. But in fact, when you look on the computer, that's not what you get for the dimension. You get fewer. And the reason is that there are uh, suddenly relations that you wouldn't expect. And I'll write one down right here. I don't see what page. Here it is. Uh, but there are, these are not independent. The first, these are not independent. And the first relation is in wave 12. The first non trivial relation. So there's one kind of easy relation. I was going to tell you about some of the wonderful relations that multiple say this satisfy. I'm going to give you quite a, a few. But let me mention two very general ones. Uh, well, first, when I did these calculations many years ago, and I just looked, you know, when, when there was some special something that struck the eye in all these relations, some very simple relation, there was one very nice one, which took 131313 n times. So the total weight is 4n. Then it was, I'll check in a second, it's a rational multiple. I think it's 4n uh, plus 2 factorial. And the denominator times 2. Anyway, if it's not that, it's something uh, exceptionally similar to that. Uh, and in fact, is that. So that was one relation. So this is a typical relation, but not a typical relation, a very atypical relation. I conjectured and it was proved about 10 years later by Broadhurst. Beautiful proof. But then another relation. If you fix k, and remember the weight of, of a tuple is just the sum of the indices, and the depth is the length. So let me fix them both. So I have any s and k, but to k, and the, the weight is always bigger than the depth, because remember you have these ki's, which are at least one, one of them is at least two. The theorem, this was discovered as a conjecture by Hoffman and proved by Grandin and myself a couple of years later independently. Then you get something very, very pretty, which is that the sum is always a to 2. I meant to say that earlier when I was giving the table. Maybe you remember that for 3, we had a to 1, 2, and a to 3, but they were each equal to 1. Well, that's because this is length 2 and this is length 3. But for 4, we had a to 1, 1, 2, a to 1, 3, a to 2, 2, and a to 4. So we have 1 of length 3, 2 of length 2, and 1 of length 1. And here the numbers were 1, 1, but here it was 1 quarter and 3 quarters. So here you see that sum form in practice that if you sum all of the ones of a given depth, then you always just get z this was times z of 4. You just get z of k once. But then in that same day with Gang Kanek, we notice that if you take the case of even ones uh, of weight k, so now s is 2. So in the case of depth 2, well, we'll also get z of k. But if the total weight is even, then you can break it up as even, even, or odd, odd. And by what I said here, the sum of those things will be z of k. But what you find is that this is always 3 quarters z of k for all k. And this is always 1 quarter of z of k. So they indeed do add up. But just as in the special case uh, right here, uh, the, the, you know, it's in the ratio of 1 to 3. Uh, yeah, it's even correct, the, the order. So that's one relation. So the first, uh, I mean, this relation always exists. So I can drop one of them because the sum of all of them is a to k over 4. But the first non trivial relation is in weight the 12. I can write it down. I just have it in my hand just so you actually have seen it. Actually, it's the first relation 
period, because uh, zeta 12, if you're very precise about it, is not actually a double zeta, it's a single zeta. So if you want just single zetas, then it wouldn't get the relation. Now the first relation is in weight 12, and it's this one. If you take 28 zeta of 93 plus 150 of zeta of 75 plus 168 zeta of 57, then you get some rational multiple. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is, it's a rational number times pi to 12, or equivalent to rational number times zeta of 12. So that's not yet a relation among the odd zetas, because that's not an odd double zeta. Of odd. But as I told you, zeta of 12 divided by 4 is the sum of all of the odds, and if you take any combination to eliminate the right hand side, you get your first relation. Now, I'm not going to go into this at all, but uh, many people in this room certainly know what a multiform is, or and many more have at least heard the word. I know it very well because that's my field, and I absolutely love them. So the number of relations, well, including this this easy one, so there would be one relation each way, but in weight 12 there are two relations. The number of relations in weight 2, so double zeta values, in weight k is an even number, turns out to be the dimension of the space of multiple forms of weight 12, whatever that is. But there are wonderful objects that I'm not going to introduce in another talk. It's not particularly hard, but I don't want to go that way. Multiple forms are an absolutely fascinating topic in number theory, and it's very well known to everybody who works with the well. There's at least one multiple form in every way, but the first non-trivial one, the first cusp form, it's called the cursive weight 12, and that's not a coincidence that it's the same weight 12. So there's this beautiful connection between uh, multiple forms and double status. And by the way, until <coughs> two years ago, I thought and everybody else thought that there's nothing interesting to be said about double zeta values of even weight, of odd weight, because for even weight you get this very nice thing that the number of relations is simply dimension of multiple forms. That's a deep part of number theory coming in. But according to Euler's theorem, which we now consider after all very elementary, it's an 18th century theorem, uh, nothing is happening in odd weight, they're just combinations of, of known numbers. So it looks very silly, but then you can play the same game as here. You look in the case of odd, you can look at odd odd, there's our odd even, then the total weight is odd, then the two parities are different. So you can try each of these. So I already told you that by Euler's theorem, in the case of odd weight, the total dimension is roughly k over 2. Well, but the way of writing k as the sum of an odd number and an even number is also k over 2 and also even odd. So in each case, in one case, you have to add zeta of k itself. In each case, you have just the right number here equal to the dimension. So it would be reasonable to guess that the space is spanned by these numbers or by these numbers, in each case, being the your independent, being a basis. You go to the computer and you find that that's wrong. One of them, I'll just make a guess, I'll make it wrong. This spans the whole space and they're independent. Well, you can't prove that they're independent, but in narrative they're independent. They span the space. But these do not span. These are not independent. And the number of relations is essentially the dimension, but well, it can't be the dimension of any k because multiple forms only exist in even weight, and k is odd. So it could have been k plus 1, it could have also been k minus 1. And in fact, it's the sum. I'm cheating very sorry, I'm subtracting 1. But essentially, this is right. So it's, it's very amusing that the multiple forms, which seems to be playing no role here because they're in odd weight, actually still come when you make this distinction according to parity, that if you do it in one way, you get everything if you do it the other get multiple forms. Well, that's just a side remark, but just as one of the connections between you know, these elementary numbers and a deeper, deeper topic. So I've given you lots of examples of uh, the types of relations you can get. There are sporadic relations, like this one that I've done projection that was proved later, 131313. There are systematic relations like this. There are other systematic relations. For instance, if you multiply value, that's actually very elementary, but I'll write it down anyway. Say that 222 two, two, uh, r times is pi to the 2r over 2r plus 1 factorial. This one, but it's the same if you, if you take, uh, for instance, 4 4 r times, then it's pi to the 4r times the simple rational number. But if you do it with 8, so 6 is very similar, but if you do it with 8, well, there's still a formula. It's 2 to the 6r plus 2 
phi to a r is again a denominator, a r plus 4 factorial. Now there's a kind of amusing numerator, square root of 2 plus 1 to the 4 r plus 2 plus square root of 2 minus 1 to the 4 r plus 2. So this number, this integer, this is an integer. It's, it's like a Fibonacci number, but it's a sort of a less trivial formula. So you have kind of amusing formulas, but these are actually not very deep. Because the essential part about multiples a is that they're multiple, that we have n less than n, or n1 less than n1 less than n2 less than n3. When all the arguments are the same, then you can commute the, the various mi's. And so then if you permute n less than n, you get n is either less than n or bigger than n, and then you just have n different from n. And the same here, you just are summing over the, dis, uh, the distinct tuples rather than the semi tuples, and that's much more elementary, so it's actually very easy to do this. This is one line using a generator even give you that as an exercise. So that's sort of some kind of a summary of, of a few of the types of identities that, that arise. So I want to now talk a little bit about the um, about things that are very recent. So, and these actually connect with, uh, with physics in a very nice way. <coughs> So maybe first I'll start with the, with the physics side and say a few words about that. So in, uh, in modern uh, quantum field theory, you want to expand certain horrible things called path intervals, which I mean, they're normally horrible because they're difficult, but above all they're horrible because they don't make any kind of mathematical sense. You're integrating something perfectly well defined, you think it's the exponential of some explicit function here called an action or some nice space of functions, but you're integrating over some infinite dimensional space, and then you're integrating with some measures, which is not defined at all mathematically, except in very special cases. So in a quantum field theory, you, you write down things that don't, that don't make a lot of sense, but the thing you're integrating over so has a parameter h bar, which in physics then would be Planck's constant, which in the classical limit, I mean, if h goes to zero, that's the classical limit, you would get back what you would get from Newtonian physics or general relativity, and if uh, h isn't zero, well, it'd be a quantum thing, but in between h being zero and h being a finite positive number, h might be infinitesimal, it might be something very, very small, and you try to expand in powers of h. And so typically, you can show that you can expansion, the formal expansion of this in powers of h, and although this doesn't make sense, you have a formal procedure to write it like this, and then these new numbers, do make sense, and this is some kind of a sum, typically over, over certain graphs, typically trees. Here you're summing over graphs with one loop, here with two loops, and so on. So the, this is uh, called the perturbative expansion, and these actual numbers, a n, are sums over graphs of very explicit integrals called finite integrals. Now these finite integrals, they're just finite dimensional integrals, sometimes they're divergent, but the case I talk about will be finite number. And the physicists really, really, really want to know what they are. They don't want the theory, they want the numbers. Because uh, when you, each of these numbers here, in this perturbative expansion, will be a sum of lots of these finite integrals, but it's a finite sum. So if you know how to compute the integrals up to a certain number of loops, you can compute the first few terms of this expansion. And since h, or whatever particular structure constant occurs in your particular theory, a coupling constant, you will get, even though this may be divergent, in fact, always is divergent, if you take you know, the first eight terms, you'll get an extremely high approximation to the physical truth, and then you go to the LHC and CERN, and you measure something, and you, you want your theory to give a number which agrees with the experiment. And uh, you know, it turns out so far it always does, but the more terms you can compute, the better the agreement is, and that confirms your belief in the whole theory. So people, and, and also makes you able to predict the results of experiments. So these numbers, I'm not going to say anything more, they're numbers people really want to write down, uh, we want to compute. And I'll talk about a particular one, these are for some particular uh, theories, which I'm not a physicist, I couldn't even say, I could say some of the names, the words, but I wouldn't know to define it. But to each graph, we're going to define an, an integral, and that is going to define an integral. And the graph, it'll just be any graph, so a graph if you have some points and some connections, the graphs I'm talking about will be uh, uh, connected. And they won't have any self-loops, so you, you can't connect one with self or any multiple edges. It's unoriented, 
But otherwise, it's, it's completely free. You can connect in a given end two points. You can either connect them or not connect them, and you want the whole thing to be. And in the particular thing I'm talking about in the physics words, it's uh, that I mentioned four theory, it's five four. This means that this graph should be at most, I'm not going to even write it down, at most four values. So at each point, at most three edges come together. Here there are three, at most four, here there are three. And there's another condition that I'll even drop. And you write down some explicit integral. Well, just for fun, I can even write down what it is. But if you're getting tired, just switch off your mind for the next minute and let it go past you, because it makes no difference at all what it, what it is. But it is actually kind of curious. You associate to G also a polynomial. It's called the Kirchhoff polynomial. It was written down, so there's some variables x, e, they're usually called alpha, e, called an x, called the Schwinger parameters. The x, e are labeled to the variables by the edges of your graph. So here, if I number the uh, edges, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, then I have x1, x2 up to x6. And this will be a polynomial. Have to begin to coefficients in, this, in these edges, in these uh, edge variables. And the definition of psi g is very nice. You take all t and g, which, is, which are trees. So a tree is something with no loops, and it should be a spanning tree. So my example, for instance, a spanning tree would be like this. I think I'll just one edge in this case. And then spanning means it's a tree, so there's no loops, but it goes through every vertex. I haven't, so no, but whenever you have a loop, you're allowed to leave off one point, and you keep leaving one edge. And you keep leaving off edges in a minimal way until you get a tree. And so this is called the spanning tree. And then the monomial you take is the product of the edges, but not the edges in the tree, the edges not in the tree. So in this case, you could cut this edge, but you could also cut this one, you could also cut this one. So since, so in this case, psi g would be simply x4 plus x5 plus x6. It's a really simple polynomial. So that's the case of polynomial if it's invented in, I think, 1847. Uh, for a problem of electrical networks. If these are networks and resistances, then this polynomial somehow tells you what the network how it will behave. But this is the same one you need for the Feynman integral. And the Feynman <coughs> integral is roughly you integrate over something with the dx as some very simple standard thing, and you divide by the square of this polynomial. So it's an integral of a rational function, but this polynomial occurs in the denominator, actually squared. And I mean, I can tell you it's in the numerator too. But what I should say is where you integrate over, you integrate over, I'll just call the delta, which is x1, x2, and so on, all greater than or equal to zero. And we can assume that there's some, it's, this is all homogeneous. So I'm actually in projector space, but I can just normalize that there's some is one. So you're integrating over a simplex, and that's the Feynman diagram. And under some small condition, this integral converges, and you want to compute it. OK, that's the background. And as I said, the main point to know from physics is just that one actually wants to know these numbers. One doesn't want some blah, 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 some theory. One wants to actually know what they are. So there's a huge industry of calculating polynomial. So for this particular type that I'm talking about, the two main people were David Rogers, an English physicist, mathematical physicist, and their primary German mathematical physicist. This was in the 90s, late 80s and 90s. And they did utterly impressive calculations. I mean, really a uh, calculation of genius. But both numerically, because sometimes these integrals are many dimensional, they have found techniques to compute them to you know, 100 digits, but also theoretically. And they went up to, I think, six loops. No, I'm pretty sure I, I know that. I'm not sure if they did every graph with six loops, but they certainly did a, 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 a maybe at some point they did everything, and they had at least many with six loops. I'm not sure if they did them all. And what they found, they found that each of these IGs was in, there of course, real numbers in the conversion. They were always in the zeta star. They always were combinations of multiple zeta numbers. So this was a, you know, kind of a spectacular fact about uh, physics. Well, for one thing, as I told you, the multiple zeta values you compute to arbitrary accuracy. So as soon as you have such a form, you really know the fine integral, both in a theoretical way, but also numerically to any sort of degree of precision. But then we want to make sense of this. So what? kinds of numbers, these are integrals, and so what kinds of integrals could reasonably be expected to be multiple zeta values? And so now I'll tell you a wonderful conjecture which was made from the wonderful mathematician who was in principle my student, although I think there were 
told him anything, but it was the other way. He told me a lot. I'd seen Konsevich, came to Bonn, knowing more mathematics than I would know in a lifetime, but didn't get a PhD, so I was officially a supervisor, and he spent you know, three weeks or something writing a 20 page doctoral piece that got him the Fields Medal. But anyway, here's my student, and he has always amazing ideas, amazing conjectures, and they're always, always right, even if they seem completely crazy, except the one that we felt to tell you, which is equally crazy as all the others, but turned out to be completely wrong. So, you know, even, uh, what's the Japanese expression? Even monkeys fall from trees, they So, uh, so his conjecture was this. We'll have to explain a little bit. So first of all, let me remind you what a variety is. An n-dimensional variety is something given, I'm being very imprecise here, after you've seen it and then you don't need it, if you haven't seen it and then you take more time. It's something given by equations, it's n-dimensional, and it's given by algebraic equations, so by polynomial equations in a finite number of variables. And I'll be completely vague, I mean, we can talk about, you know, smooth projective varieties or schemes over C or all kinds of things, but just think that if n is zero, it's a point. If n is one, it's a curve. So the curve could be, for instance, <coughs> uh, just a straight line, which is just uh, it's called affine one space, or it could be a projective space where you add a point of infinity, or it might be an elliptic curve given by an equation like x cubed plus seven, seven x minus three, but that would be an elliptic curve. And similarly, if n is true, it's called the surface. And after that, they don't really have names. They're just called uh, threefold, fourfold. So I could have said n-fold instead of variety. So we have the notion of a variety. And so, of course, you can be not very specific about what you're allowing. But just think of smooth, nice varieties. Uh, uh, this isn't a very smooth variety. So then, uh, you think of a complex curve that would look like a Riemann surface. It might look like that if it gives you this true. And so you can do two things with a variety. So in the modern theory, varieties are part of a theory that doesn't completely exist, but the big parts that now exist for many years is completely conjectural, which is the theory of motives. So a motive is an even more general thing. That every variety is a motive. And to any variety, or in fact, to every motive, you can associate sort of numbers in two ways. One is you take a prime p, or it might be a prime power. Q, which is P to the I. And the other way you take, well, the number theorists like to talk about the infinite prime, but what it really means is you sort of work over the real numbers or over the complex numbers. And so in each case, I want to make numbers. <coughs> and so the numbers here will be will integrate something over something. So this something here will be a cycle, some z sitting in your variety. So x is your variety. Something given by bunch of equations. You have a smaller dimensional piece sitting in it. The typical case would be here. Uh, our original variety here was actually the projective space p n minus one of c, where n is the number of edges, which will be twice. In, in the good case that I want it to be twice the degree of this polynomial. This is not such a good case, but in the good cases, so n would be the number of edges. This would be my x. And the z would be this, in this particular case, the simplex, where all of the xi's were real numbers, the general shape should have been complex, with some one. Well, in the projective space, you don't need just real numbers. Both of real numbers. So you integrate, and here you have some differential form. So you know, if, it's one, if this z is one dimensional, it will be solved with dx1, dx2. But if it's two dimensional, with dx1 times dx2, and so on. So you'll have some kind of an i-dimensional cycle in this n-dimensional thing. And this will be an i form. So so you get a bunch of those numbers because there are many differential forms in many cycles, but still a very explicit list. And these numbers are of huge interest and they're called periods. So actually I have a paper with Maxim Konsevich explaining a little about periods and how they're connected with zeta values and so on. But the other thing you can do is you just have n and q of x, which is the number of points, the number of solutions uh, over at q. So we think of q as just the prime, so I'm working, let's say q is p, which is 17. So I just take my equations. I have some equations, like this equation, the typical case, and this is an equation relating numbers. So they might be integers, they might be rational, they might be complex numbers. But we can also think of them as numbers modulo 17. 
So I can ask how many x's are there multiplied by 17? So 0 mod 17 mod up to 16. And y, that 6 to 17 squared pairs x and y. But only some of them will satisfy y squared equals x to 7x minus 3 multiplied by 17. And so that number will be called, if this was my x, then I would get n17 of x would be the number of solutions, which I can easily work out, say 15 or something, the number of points. So this is how you get numbers. And so that's, that's the general, uh, general story. So there are two basic things you do with varieties. So you make real numbers. So these are real numbers, which are the end of periods, which are but very, very special real numbers. They're only counted in any periods. They're uncounted in any real numbers. So these periods are real numbers, or complex numbers, but very, very special ones, coming from integrating nice differential forms over something. And the other is this counting. And now let's make a subspace of all varieties, and I'll call them easy varieties. The technical name, and so I'll just write it down in case any of you have seen this work. So what they're actually called these days is mixed state motives. So motives is this generalization, it's not completely defined uh, in all cases, but there's a subspace of Smaller set called Tate motives, which is way too strict, and then mixed, which is a little more general. And that part of the theory is completely well defined. But I don't want to, uh, I'm just saying that in case anyone has seen these words. Let's just call them easy varieties. And what is easy about them is that n q of x, I mean, x is the variety. If I fix the variety x, well, it is fixed, but I vary the, 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 the q, then I can ask how many functions are there as a function of q, and maybe it's going to be a polynomial. So you get integral coefficients. And that's very, very, very rare. But let's call those varieties even, e easy. It almost never happens. So my examples, well, here are just a straight line. So it's just x. And if x is an fq, then obviously there are q possibilities. So here p of q would be q. Here p of q would be q plus 1. But here p of q is something, even p of p for a prime is something very difficult. I mean, it's not p. n p of x for this thing, if p is a prime, is roughly the p coefficient of a modular form. Well, I didn't get, I only mentioned modular forms before, but let's say this, this thing, which I just wrote down like this, but this used to be called the Tamiyama Bay conjecture before it became Wiles' theorem. The proof's about 10,000 pages. So this, these are not easy numbers. So even for elliptic curves, which are equated like this, y squared to cubic, this n p of x is the Fourier coefficient of a multiple form, but that was Wiles' theorem, the Vincelli Fermat's last theorem. And that's got a 10,000 page proof. You put together all of the mathematics leading up to it that Wiles used. Well, maybe it's 3,000. I mean, nobody's really counted. But anyway, it's a huge, huge part of very, very abstract, advanced algebraic geometry and number theory. So, and that's already for the easiest case after points, which is just curves, and elliptic curves, which are the simplest, just a degree three. And you go to higher curves, then there's a conjecture which is completely unproof. Wiles only did the case of curves of genus one, but it certainly says that they'll even be more complicated. So for instance, no curve will ever be an easy variety except this, the line in P1, or P1 minus the finite number of points. So it's extremely rare. But still these things exist, so think of these as very, very, very rare and, and special. But, but somehow they're things that you understand. Well, there was a, what was shown several years ago by Gonchard and Delinia, was that multiple zeta values, so fact, and there may be other people involved, every multiple zeta value is a period of an easy variety. So there's a specific integral that you can write down, uh, but then you, you have to show that it's such that it for, and falls into this motivic setting. The integral itself is quite easy, but then you have to write in just the web, you know, leaving out lots of technicalities and difficult definitions to show that it is a period of a mixed state mode in the sense of the theory. So this was an easy fact, but still it's relatively easy once you've understood what it means. But then there was a conjecture which became a theorem last year of Francis Brown, which said the other thing is true too. So in fact, every easy variety, and as I told you, there are infinitely many, even though they're very rare. Like for curves, it's essentially one, or only one compact one, it's P1. But in higher dimensions, there are, you know, there are certainly infinitely many of them, they're just very rare. And the conjecture, which he has now proved, 
was that every period of these uh, easy varieties, so every easy period, let's say, was a multiple zeta value. And so if you put this together, and by the way, I have an input on this. For this, he needed an identity. He could reduce everything to just one thing that he absolutely didn't know how to do. He had to be able to compute these numbers, the multiple zeta values, where all of the arguments are twos except one, which is a three. And he, if he had a formula for that, and if the formula had some property, which he hoped it would have, then he could prove it. But you know, on the computer, he found the formulas for the first few, but they had very, very complicated uh, form, and he couldn't even guess the general formula. He asked me, and I found this formula. So actually, I have a little input here too. So our papers are next to each other, and it's about that. It's my elementary one showing that this is some explicit thing. Actually, what I show is that it belongs to the double zeta values, so z the appropriate weight, which is the sum, and here the weight is all, so by order we kind of know that number. So I gave an explicit formula which he needed, and then uh, his thing is you know, very, very, very deep. It's in, uh, in no way accomplished this little identity, but still, uh, that, was, that was an ingredient. So anyway, a year ago he proved this. So if you look at this, this tells you that, what does this mean, just logically? It means if you see an integral of a differential form, so you're integrating over some cycle, or some chain, of some differential form. And it's equal to a multiple zeta value. Then you expect, so this is some cycle in a z on some variety x. Then you expect x should be easy. I mean, of course, you can't quite deduce it to that, because he doesn't say that periods of non-easy variety might not happen to also be multiple zeta values. But then there's just no reason at all. So the, the natural expectation, that was Concepcion's conjecture. See, in this case, the, um, I, I lied to you, x is not pn minus 1 of c. x is a subset of codimension 1 of pn minus 1 of c, given by the psi g of x equals 0. So we have one equation, which is this polynomial, which I told you about. It's homogeneous, so it makes sense in projective space. And it defines a hypersurface so n minus 2 dimensional variety in pn minus 1. In this case, this is the variety. And so we've associated to each graph a variety, xg, and a cycle on it, z, and this integral. And this integral, up to six loops, always turned out to be a multiple zeta value. Well, multiple zeta values by this conjecture became the theorem, conjecture of Concepcion before it was a theorem. You expected that to mean it's easy. And so Concepcion's conjecture was that if you we associate to a graph, then we have this xg that I just told you about, simply the zero locus of this very explicit Kirchhoff polynomial, a very famous 150-year, uh, 170 year old polynomial, that this thing is always easy. So it's always in these tables. So about two years later, it was checked that that was true up to six loops. For every graph up to six loops, this really was an easy variety. And so that completely explained, together with this, with this fact, that explained why the periods were multiple zeta values and why Broadhurst and Kreimer had been finding multiple zeta values whenever they did these quantum field theory calculations. So this was the conjecture. And then about two years later, it was disproved, and it was disproved in the hard, strongest way that you can imagine. It's completely false. Remember that easy means that this counting function is the easiest thing it can be. As a function of Q, it's just a polynomial. And as I told you in general, the counting function, even if a very simple looking variety of this elliptic curve is something horrendously complicated, in this case, coefficients for modular form. So it, it, it was proved by uh, Rossman and Belkali in 2003, about five years after the conjecture had been made, was that not only is it not true that the counting function, this n cube x for every, each of these varieties coming from graph, not only are they not all polynomials, but they're completely generic, namely any counting function of any variety at all is a combination, a finite combination of counting varieties of these expression, of the counting functions of these very special ones. So they showed that for any x at all, and remember these things can be arbitrarily complicated, that for any x, there's a finite combination depending only on x of various graphs, so a finite sum over certain graphs, and then this counting function is just a combination of the functions, counting functions of those graphs. So far from these just being polynomials, they're completely generic. They Span the space, everything you can ever get. So it was an utterly wrong conjecture. Now Francis Brown has very explicit uh, examples uh, because the, the examples of Belkabe and Rolson 
were not physical. So these, uh, they were graphs, but the, uh, these, these inputs were completely divergent. So they didn't affect the physics, and then the hope remained that, you know, at least for those special ones, that Franz Brown now has a complete theory, and starting at eight loops, there are examples of graphs that are primitively divergent, five, four graphs, they do everything the physicists wanted, they would be, they would give numbers you could measure on the large hadron collider, the really honestly things, and the functions you get are definitely not multiple zeta values, and actually definitely involve modular forms, and not just other numbers. So that's the connection with physics, and maybe I'll just mention in words another connection, which I spoke of a few days ago in Trieste in the physics center there, there are also in string theory numbers that you want to count so called string amplitudes. It started with the form of Veneziano 30 years ago, and then many other people, Vera Soro and Green and Schwartz and all kinds of people. And there's again a huge industry, it's very related to find it's, it's a somewhat different direction. These are integrals of products of Green's functions. And then in certain cases it turns out that these um, so I'll just say also string amplitudes is the people I've seen or like the, the combination of words, string amplitudes often, in certain cases, so this is for genus zero and genus one, and we don't know much about it, so it's tree level and one level, they at least very often give very, very interesting combinations of multiple zeta values. So that's uh, another connection with theoretical physics. And I guess I didn't say anything about geometry, but you can't have everything, so I'll start. <laughs> I tried to, I said it, uh, but maybe that went by too fast. I, I, I even crossed out the word first shuffle relation. It's not a relation among multiple same values. It's a product rule. The first shuffle formula, I should have called it, says that if you multiply any two multiple zetas, think of each one as a multiple sum. And then when you put the two sums together, it's like shuffling cards. You have here M1 less than M2 less than M3. And next to it, you have L1 less than L2 less than L3. And when you shuffle them, the L's and the M's can be in any order with respect to each other, but each L, the L's are increasing and the M's are increasing. And so you get a lot of multiple centers. That was the first shuffle. And the second said that the same product was another combination. And so either one alone gives no relations at all. It just tells you how to multiply. It just tells you of a ring. But it doesn't give any linear relations. But since both of them give arbitrary products, Z of K1 times Z of K2, or K1 and K2 are arbitrary tuples, then by equating them, you get one relation, but it's the double shuffle relation. It's not two sets of relations. I mean, people almost all say the first shuffle relation and the second, but it's not what they mean. There's only the double shuffle relation, but it's the fact that those two things are equal. So uh, that's the thing that I said I could actually write down on the board where the general second shuffle relation comes from. I gave one example with partial fractions. And by equating those two things, so we had two, I mean, I don't think I can do it in real time that I didn't write down. Maybe I've written down an example. But if you multiply, for instance, zeta 2 times zeta 3, this would be really simple. Now. Then we already saw you get zeta 2 comma 3 plus zeta 3 comma 2 plus zeta 5. That's the first shuffle. But if you do it the other way, you'll get a completely different formula. And now, if you forget that this is what it is, just that these two forms are equal to each other, that's the relation. So there, there's no halfway. It's, it's just. Actually, I'm still lying a little. There is a halfway. <laughs> because once you use, remember that Z star, the sum of these is not just a vector space, but a ring. Well, we, we only care about the things that positive way. Nobody cares about Z zero, it's just number one. So if you have a ring, you can look at that ring modulo, positive thing squared, which is products. So it's modulo decomposable elements. So it's called the indecomposables. And now, Suddenly, the first shuffle relation is a shuffle, is a relation, because by z of k prime times z of k double prime is equal to some sum with some coefficients of z of k, then this is decomposable. 
So if I work multi decomposable things, I just set this equal to zero. I work in the uh, quotient rings in decomposables. Then this becomes a relation. And then you can ask if just the first or just the second separately. And then we know the complete answer. They aren't nearly enough, but we know exactly what dimension you get. But if you put them together, then we, we, we cannot get you know, the, the right number to come out. So I, I don't know if that's an answer, but I uh, have an answer. Uh, what was it more or less what you want to know? So OK, I mean, I can say a few words more. If you just put in, if you look in a given weight and depth, but just in the proposal, so we work multiple things of higher depth and also multiple products. Then either shuffle relation alone gives you some relations. That dimension is exactly known, and it's the dimension of a certain Lie algebra. And it can be computed by, by some standard form of, of Hull. But now when you take the two shuffle, and the same is true for the shuffle, the second shuffle, in fact they're isomorphic. Because if you remember in my proof for the doubles, one of the relations is d of x, y plus d of y, x in some things. And the other one is d of x, x plus y plus d of y, y plus x. So in general, if it's not double but triple, the triple would be x, y, z. You'd have several terms, but here you would have x, x plus y, x plus y, plus z. The two relations are actually isomorphic to each other. There are just as many solutions of this as there are solutions of that. But when you intersect them, you get some completely mysterious new thing, and that's the part we don't understand. So the answer is basically we know each part's each self-shelf relation alone is easy, but the combination is, is mysterious. My question was the Why not? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 so they, they need time to prepare the drinks, so <laughs> actually they want to be as slow as possible. In the intersection. My question was about all the don't consider the intersection, but only one of the sets. Uh, do you get set? Do you get that's just what I answered. Then I said we, we that, that it's, it, that's exactly what I answered. I thought in great detail. If you just look at the linear, you get nothing because it's not a relation. Okay. It's simply the empty set. The set of relations here. If you look at all the proposals, then I said you get a well-defined thing and it's completely understood it's the dimension of the Lie algebra. So if you just look at the first or just look at the second, that thought is okay. what you were asking, then we know exactly what you get. The dimensions for each weight and for each depth, we can tell you exactly the, the number of linearly independent things that you get if you only, so if you imagine just formal symbols satisfying the first collection of double shuffles, or, or the first collection, or the second shuffle, and you work multiple decomposables, otherwise you have nothing. There is, they aren't relations. Then for each weight and each depth, we know the exact dimension of that space, and it's it's completely understood, and it's, a, it's canonically isomorphic to the form of a certain Lie algebra. It's a Hopf algebra structure. We know everything. If you put them together, then we know nothing. Well, we don't know nothing. We know something. We don't know that you get down to the dimension we want, which is this dk. In another direction, we neither know that it's enough nor that it's too much. I mean, no, we don't know that the dimension is less than or equal to the dk I predict, or greater than or equal. We simply don't know. So the proof that the dimension of the whole space was bounded by my conjectural dk is not by double shuffles. It's completely different. So, the, the, that's, so each one separately we have to understand. I think there were other hands. Maybe they've been withdrawn in so much sales, <laughs> in a field or something. I mean, but you to go to the drink and ask well, the question. Come, come here and ask the question. If the drinks are ready, the people making the drinks had asked us if we could give them five minutes to make the drinks. I was hoping there would be some more questions. But yeah, otherwise, I'm sure there will be some questions. Then let's the drink. I wish that. Yeah, then let's go drink. <laughs> <laughs>